Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody, to another episode of Aesthetic Decentralized. I'm your host, Jonathan Deon. And with me today, I'm very happy to have my dear friend, Nicolas. Nicolas, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you for having me, Jonathan. My name is Nicholas Krusek. I'm coming all the way from Vancouver, British Columbia. I have a master's degree in historical musicology. And for the past 15 years, I've been teaching music history and music theory, both uh, in private tutorials and in various classroom situations. So I'm excited to be here to talk about music. That's great, that's great. So uh, Nicholas, I'm very, very excited. Uh, as you said, you are an expert on music. So uh, this is a topic that I haven't touched, I, I, just a, perhaps a tiny bit I've touched on some of my writing. I'm not sure if you have re read it, but I, I've uh -huh. extensively talked about uh, painting and uh, sculpt sculpture, less sculpture, I, I tend to focus more on painting. Music to me has always been a mystery. I, I, I cannot um, an, an, an analyze a, a work of music not any, anywhere close to the way I can I can analyze the painting. So perhaps you could tell us for a start, how should we, what is the, is there a right way to listen to classical music? First of all, I'll say we can definitely learn something from each other because although I know a fair bit about music, I know nothing at all about analyzing painting and sculpture. Okay. So I'm sure there's a lot you could tell me about those subjects. Sure. Where to begin? Well, the first thing to approach music when you're listening to any kind of music of any complexity or sophistication, it has to occupy your full attention. So I always recommend to students, if you're listening, whenever you're listening to great music, don't listen to music while doing something else. For example, while driving or doing housework or eating a meal, there, there is music that is suitable as background ambiance for those sorts of activities. But when you're listening to symphonies, string quartets, piano sonatas, it requires a fair degree of concentration. And so you, when I listen to music, I just listen to music. I don't do anything else. So that would be the first principle that I would lay down for listening to classical music. Well, I can definitely relate from my own experience. When I started listening to classical music, I would say about a year ago, a, a bit more than a year ago, I always liked classical music, but I never actually tried to focus on a work of classical music. And indeed, it does require that focus. Uh, I, can, I remember the first time that I listened to Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. When I really listened to that, it was an, such a powerful experience, it's almost spiritual, I would say, listening to, to such a tremendous uh, work of music. And when you're really listening to it, you can really feel it. You get, you get all, all sorts of feelings. You get, you can, it really affects you emotionally i think music speaks to emotions the, the strongest out of any art form i would say uh, but but I, I myself can get very excited from painting so it, it is a bit personal i would uh, personal i would say but it is. but indeed music is can have a very powerful effect if you are focused so um perhaps you could give us some advice um, should we start when, when I we have a, perhaps a, a listener here who is a complete complete novice to classical music? Where should he start with? Should he, should he go to listen to a symphony, a, a Beethoven's Fifth, or something, or should he start with something perhaps a prelude or a concerto, something lighter than a symphony? How would you approach it? Okay, so there's two parts to my answer. The first part is really a corollary to what I said before about the importance of focus, the importance of concentration. I'd also say repeated listenings, whatever you listen to from whatever historical period, listening to it again and again is crucial for getting the most out of it. For example, you go to a symphony concert, you go to a recital, you go to an opera, you hear a new or unfamiliar piece of music once, and it goes by, you get something out of it, you get some content out of the experience, and then it's gone. In order to get the most out of any kind of musical experience, it's necessary to revisit it again and again. So I always encourage students to listen to any piece of music over and over again. And I'd like to illustrate that with a particular story. So okay. over a decade ago, when I was at the beginning of my teaching career, 
I was doing these lectures at a local for a local school board, a kind of an introduction to concerts by the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. And I remember I was giving this one talk on Be uh, Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony, which the symphony was going, the Vancouver Symphony was going to be doing in about a week or so. And I gave an introduction to the symphony. I played some snippets from a recording. And there was one student in the class, a young man who actually later on became a private pupil of mine. And he was really excited about it. And he said, I'm going to go home and I'm going to listen to the symphony a couple of times before I go to the concert. Wow. So I saw before him again about a week again. or two later. Wow. And I said, so how was the Tchaikovsky fifth experience? And he said it was fantastic. You know, I found a recording on YouTube and I listened to the symphony 20 times wow. before I went to the concert. Now, that's a little that's a little bit extreme 20 times i don't say that you have to listen to a piece 20 times to get the most out of it but he said you know, having listened to the piece so many times as i was sitting there in the concert i knew what was going to happen next i knew exactly where the music was going and what twists and turns it would take so that gives you some sort of an, ex an idea of the kind of work that's required to get the most out of any musical experience now, as to the question of where to begin, that's very personal, very individual, and it's going to differ from one, listen to an, one listener to another. Probably everybody has, has some idea of what kind of music they respond to. Many people, for example, respond to the mu music of the 19th century romantics. Some people, on the other hand, respond to the music of the late 18th century classics, like Haydn, Mozart, early Beethoven. I would say begin with what you're most comfortable with, what, what speaks to you most immediately, and then gradually branch out from there. So if you're, for example, like me, I started off by listening to the 19th century romantics, and then gradually I went in both directions on either side. I went and I started listening to the late 18th century classics, then I went into the early 18th century, then I gradually went into the early 20th century, you know, the first few decades of the 20th century. And over a period of many years, I got to know the entire history of European music just by starting from the 19th century and branching out in either direction. So I start I strongly recommend find out what speaks to you most what what you relate to most clearly and then gradually go beyond that. And also uh, the question of genre comes up. Some people for example like opera the best, some people like symphonies or chamber music. So I would start there, start there with most, what's most familiar, and then explore pieces in other genres by the same composer. Yeah, but, well, I, I, would, I, would, I would agree with you on that, but I would, I would say it takes a lot of time to do that. I, I have a few pieces on my playlist that I listen to again and again. I have uh, Rachmaninoff's uh, second and third concertos, which I admire. I have uh, Tchaikovsky's uh, first concerto, also piano concerto, which is very powerful. Uh, oh, of course, Beethoven's uh, symphony. I think the seventh is my favorite, I would say. Uh, also, I really like, love, like the, the fifth. I actually like the, the ninth uh, l less than uh, the fifth, which is, which is controversial, I, I think. Um, but I mean, I, I don't seem to have any time to, to branch out to other music because I, I still trying to figure out uh, symphonies that I've been listening to 10 times, 20 times. It's still not enough. So it, it's difficult that diversification of, of uh, classical music, but because it does require that focus, which most of people don't have uh, much uh, free time in there. We are very busy people. People work all day, their families. Where could they implement that music into their life? Well, you say you don't have much time, but you have a whole lifetime, right? You're young, you have a whole lifespan ahead of you. So it's a gradual process. I mean, I've been listening to music for 30, 35 years now. So I've, I've branched out very, very gradually, very slowly in the earlier years. So for me, I started off, I think my first connection was with Tchaikovsky's ballet music. And then from there, I gradually branched out into the symphonies, the concertos, you know, still just focusing on the music of one composer. Then I started looking at some of the music of Tchaikovsky's contemporaries, Dvořák, uh, some of the French and uh, okay. some of the yeah. other Russian, yeah, some of the other Russian composers from that period. I got to know the New World Symphony and other pieces. And then only after that did I branch out into Rachmaninoff, later Russian composers, and then earlier composers, uh, Beethoven, of course. Uh, you know, it took me a couple of years to get into the Beethoven symphonies and to get okay. to know them really, really well. 
So it depends on the kinds of experiences that are open to you. Do you go to live concerts very much? No, no. I wish. I wish uh, we had in, in Israel. We have we have the Philharmonic, Israeli Philharmonic, which is they are pretty good. But we, I noticed that in their concerts, it's probably a trend also in Canada. They have a, a massive concert with uh, three pieces. Once is uh, the first one is a huge uh, classical piece, uh, you know, Tchaikovsky, Beethoven, and then they enter like a the modern something, uh, modern garbage, usually by some Israeli, and then they enter another classical piece. So they they try to ruin the experience by implementing the the most horrible piece of contemporary. Some of it is just noise. It's just it's horrible. But, but That's interesting. I think I think you would probably like what the Vancouver Sym Symphony does much better. They usually do the modern garbage right at the very beginning of the concert. And many, many people know this. So they actually many people deliberately arrive at the concert late. They come 15, 20 minutes late after the contemporary piece or the piece by a local composer. And then they settle down uh, to enjoy the real music afterwards. But that's it's very, very common. I think the reason is because orchestras today are so dependent on government funding and they have to meet certain targets they have to do a certain they have to reach a certain quota of contemporary music of pieces by contemporary composers or local composers you know so Canadian orchestras have to do a certain amount of music by Canadian composers and nowadays there's all sorts of other quotas like you have to do certain amount of music by minority composers you know black composers or aboriginal oh, composers oh, yes, yes. so there's there's all these different hoops that arts organizations who That's require government funding that they have to jump through in order to in order to be able to survive that's fascinating that, that aspect of it well also in, in the soviet uh, russia the the bolshoi uh, orchestra the most famous right uh, is also a government fund but they didn't play any of that modern garbage so i wouldn't say it's entirely that a uh, fact that it's government it, even if it's government funded it doesn't have to be that kind of music I, I don't i don't i wouldn't say that in the soviet union it was the reverse situation that in there there were certain requirements that music had to conform to the dictates of socialist realism so it had to be accessible to the masses it had to have a certain popular appeal a certain degree of simplicity so anything that was too modern too dissonant too avant-garde was ruled out for, for ideological reasons, but it was still because of the government control over the arts. Okay, is that so? It was a similar cause, but a different consequence. That's interesting. Okay, so let's talk a little, a little bit about beauty. The, the, I think the, the biggest and most fascinating aspect of, of art is beauty. We, I think we respond to beauty in all, all fields all over, across our lives. We respond to, to beauty in other people. We respond to beauty in art, in the car we, we, would, we would like to buy, in the house that we live. We would like to everything to be beautiful around us. And the beauty in music is a very unique kind of beauty, beauty because it's not visual. It's all instrumental. So, but, but how does that, principle of beauty that you you have in, in a painting in a beautiful piece of painting what is so beautiful about it that is also the same principle as in the painting that also applies to music what, what would you say about that well there are a few different ways that beauty plays a role in music for, for one thing there's melodic beauty there's, there's the beauty that comes from a particular melody that communicates a very strong emotion and here i would say the touchstone is probably italian opera not just Italian composers, but composers of other nations really learned about melodic beauty by listening to and studying Italian music. So for example, if you listen to Handel's music or Bach's music, you know, two very major German Baroque composers, a lot of what they thought of in terms of melodic beauty came from the music of Vivaldi, the music of Corelli, the music of Scarlatti and other composers. Now we've talked a little bit about Russian music, Russian composers. The Russians learned a lot about melodic beauty from Italian opera. Uh, when Tchaikovsky was a young lad, his favorite opera was Mozart's Don Giovanni, which of course is an, an Italian opera by a German composer. Uh, besides that, Tchaikovsky was very much drawn to the music of composers like Bellini, 
Rossini, Donizetti, and they had a very strong influence on his conception of what melodic beauty was, as distinct from, say, the kind of melodic character of a Beethoven symphony or a Beethoven sonata, which is a, a little more abstract, a little less purely melodic or not, not conceived vocally. I think the essence of Italian melody is that it's conceived in terms of the human voice. So even when you have music by violinist composers like Corelli and Vivaldi, they're treating the violin as an extension of, of the human voice. They're trying to make the instrument sing. Or in the case of a composer like Domenico Scarlatti, he tries to make the keyboard instrument sing the way a voice would. And it, it's that vocal quality of Italian music that was so influential on composers of other nationalities. I would also mention Chopin in this connection. Chopin, one of Chopin's favorite composers was Vincenzo Bellini. He loved Bellini's operas and he, his idea of what the piano should sound like is an extension of the human voice along the lines of Bellini's operatic arias. That's very interesting. I, I never thought of the connection that how, how it's interesting that an Italian musician could could affect a, a Russian music because they're so different uh, culturally, these uh, two cultures, um, which is it's very interesting. How is that there are no mu new revolutionary composers. We don't see another Beethoven. Could you, how is that? Where does that come from? Why is it because of the culture we live in? Is it because of the philosophy? What do you think about that? I think the breach between the, the contemporary composer and his public began sometime during the 19th century. Up until then, composers had basically been either servants uh, attached to the church or to a particular patron, a particular aristocrat or a particular nobleman. So composers had to create music that was pleasing to a particular listener or a particular audience. Now, over the course of the 19th century, that was still true. The audience was gradually growing. There was a larger middle class audience. Thanks to the innovations of capitalism, there was a, a growing middle class, there were more opera houses, more concert halls. So now composers were having to appeal to a much larger middle class public. But something else that happened during the course of the 19th century is that performers began to delve more and more into the music of the past. So pianists began to introduce into their repertoire music by composers from the 18th century. Conductors began more and more to perform music by earlier composers, Mozart, Haydn, uh, then they went back to Bach and Handel and even earlier. And so now contemporary composers were not only competing with each other, they were not only competing with their contemporaries, but they were also competing with the illustrious dead. They were competing with their great rivals from many generations earlier. And the immediate consequence of this is that composers had to develop very striking recognizable style. So composers developed all sorts of tricks, tricks of instrumentation, of harmony to make their music stand out somehow. But gradually composers began to write music regardless of what audiences actually liked. And we see this particularly towards the end of the 19th century. There's a breach between the kind of music that audiences want to listen to and the kind of music that composers want to write. So whereas at the beginning of the century, at the beginning of the 19th century, almost all the music that was being performed was hot off the presses, you know, the ink was still drying on the page. By the end of the century, the concert hall and the opera house had virtually become a kind of museum devoted to the great works of the past and contemporary composers were gradually being squeezed out. They were struggling for fewer and fewer spots on concert programs and within operatic seasons. And the consequence of this was that by the time we get to the early 20th century composers, many, many composers just said to hell with it. I'm just going to write whatever music I want, whatever music appeals to me. And if people listen to it, fine. If people don't listen to it, that's also fine. And then this breach between the, the composer and the public just intensified over the course of the 20th century. Now the situation today, I wouldn't say that there are no great composers or no interesting composers in the world today. What I often tell people when I'm asked this question and I get this question again and again, many of the most talented composers today work in film and television. Oh, that's and you right. can probably think of many examples, yes. John Williams, Howard Shore, Absolutely. there are many composers you know, you know, who write for all the big film franchises, Star Wars, Harry Potter, right. whatever. Uh, 
Ennio Morricone is another good example. He, uh, you know, the great Italian film composer. So many, a lot of the most talented work is being done by composers in the area of film music. And there, there are also some composers who do both, who do some work in film and television, but also some work in more traditional medias like symphony and opera. Philip Glass is an example of a composer who's been successful in that regard. He's he's had major concertos and symphonies and operas performed, but he's also worked with directors like Martin Scorsese, Woody Allen, and so on. So that's that's the direction that music seems to be taking in recent generations. That's very interesting that the integration of film with music. I, I didn't actually think, think about it, but yeah, I mean, uh, Hans Zimmer, uh, John Williams, they're all great composers, that's right. Uh, okay, so... Uh, that's it. The, interesting. Uh, what you said about the the there is the there was a bridge between the composer and the the public, and I would say the same thing you could see in other art. You could see the contemporary painters, for example, they they paint nothing. The the modern uh, abstract painters, they even uh, they'll present a, an empty canvas. And who, which kind of, who, who, who will buy these kinds of artworks? People who are, you know, uh, uh, these kinds of avant-garde, they, they, they are very, perhaps they have that, I would say corruption, philosophical corruption, but it, it's also, I don't see anyone from, from from the street, people every, in my everyday life going to en enjoy that kind of music. And it's, it's very different than what was happening in the 19th century where people did go to concerts, they did go to museums to, to, as a part of their daily, uh, as part of their weekend activities. They would go to, it was entertainment back then. Today we have YouTube, we have Netflix. Back then we had museums and we had the concerts. And, and that is completely different today. Yeah, and that's true in literature as well. Like in the 19th century, people still took an interest in what writers were writing. People would, for, for enjoyment, read Alexandre Dumas, Charles Dickens, Victor Hugo. If you look at the 20th century literary landscape, the kind of fiction that people enjoy reading and the kind of fiction that's held up as great by the critics and the, uh, the scholars is completely different. Absolutely. And why, why is that? Why, why is there such a, such a bridge? Why, what, what do you think about that? I'm, I'm still struggling to think. I, I would say philosophy. I would, I would say Kant, but that's a very complicated point to, 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 to explain in, in, such a, in such a format. What, what okay, do you I, think, think? I think I can explain a little bit of that. Now, the, idea, the study of music history, musicology, which is the, the field I specialize in, that really began in the 19th century. And right from the very beginning, historical musicology was strongly influenced by the ideas of Hegel, by Hegel's ideas about, about history. You know about the, the thesis yes, and the like antithesis it. and the synthesis, about music, history being a kind of a progress towards some sort of an end. Now, where this began to infiltrate musicology is in the idea that music as an art has to progress from one generation to another, that you have, for example, one type of music in a certain generation, and then in the next generation, the new music challenges that or changes it somehow, and then the following generation affects a kind of a synthesis between these different elements. Uh, and this was an idea that many 19th century composers bought into, uh, most notably Franz Liszt and Richard Wagner were uh, close followers of Hegel's idea about the, the inevitable progress of history. And then that eventually leads to the aesthetics of composers like Gustav Mahler, Arnold Schoenberg, and uh, throughout the 20th century, there was always this idea that music has to progress, that it has to push boundaries. Uh, this incidentally is another reason why the kind of music which has always been held up by music theorists and music historians is not the kind of music that people generally like. Take a, if you look at the, the, say the early 20th century in music, who were the composers that were the most popular in the early decades of the 20th century? Rachmaninoff would be one example. Uh, Giacomo Puccini in, opera, in Italian opera would be another, Edward Elgar, and I could think of a few other examples. It was the composers whose music maintained a strong tie with the 19th century, 
who they, they added some ideas of their own, some melodic and harmonic ideas of their own, but basically their music was coming out of the aesthetics of the 19th century romanticism. Whereas the kind of composers, and, and those are the, those composers, the very popular composers are almost completely ignored in histories of music, in accounts of 20th century music, because the, the story of 20th century music is usually taught through the innovators, the composers who pushed boundaries, who left the past behind. And that, of course, give, includes composers like Schoenberg, like Stravinsky, who are, you know, all, all excellent and worthy composers in their own ways, but who have audiences have been reluctant to embrace the music of some of these composers. Okay. That's that's very interesting. I mean, I I I want to talk about another aspect that another uh, an idea that is started with romanticism. I I know it from painting, but I, I can feel it also in music. Uh, let's talk about the sublime, the idea of the sublime, which I think is a fascinating idea, and it has been confused a lot of time. I would argue with individualism. The people who the, would see, uh, for example, the works of Caspar uh, David Friedrich, who I, I admire, the painter. Uh, with the, like the wander uh, above the sea of fog. Yes, uh, that's one exactly. of my favorites as well. Yes, it, it is also one of mine, but he has been confused that it's about individualism. I would say it is not. It is about the, the greatness of nature. And even that in that, that is, uh, an anomaly that painting i would say because you can i think objectively analyze it as casper david friedrich is saying yes man is great he's able he can achieve he can he can reach the summit of great mountains but if you re if you remember there is in the distance more mountains and they are taller so and 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 everything down there is is a fog it's all it's all mystical it's unclear and I would, what I would argue is Caspar David Friedrich, by accident, has shown us a, a picture of man, how, how man is great and, and able. But what he's actually meaning to say, which is more consistent with the rest of his paintings, if you are familiar, you have the famous uh, monk by the sea, which is, you can see a very, very small monk and a huge sea. What is, what, is it also about individualism? No, of course not. So what Caspar David Friedrich is saying, whatever mountains men, whatever summits men will reach, there will always be more and there will be taller because God is infinite and God is always more powerful than man. So how, however much you think man is great, nature will always be greater. And that is a reoccurring theme along all of his paintings. So you have that idea also in music. You have, for example, in Wagner, you have great... Uh, which I also very like. He has great passages about, you can feel the, the grandeur, the greatness of it. And that is the sublime, right? So perhaps you could, you could talk, uh, you obviously know much more than me about the sublime in music. So where the sublime begins to enter musical aesthetics is sometime just after the turn of the 19th century in, in the very early 1800s. I'll give you a concrete example. So uh, in the year, I think it was around 1807 or 1808, there was a very famous concert in Vienna uh, put on by Beethoven uh, of his own music. It was actually in the dead of winter. It was in uh, December in an unheated church. Wow. And I think the concert went on for four or five hours. Wow famous concert where Beethoven premiered his fifth symphony, his pastoral symphony, his fourth piano concerto, and a couple of other works. And the concert also featured some piano improvisations by Beethoven himself, who, whose hearing was gradually declining at the time. Now, that concert was reviewed. It was There was a famous review by E.T.A. Hoffmann, you know, the famous German uh, short story writer and critic. And in this review, Hoffman compared the music of the contemporary composers, uh, and he talked also about Haydn and Mozart uh, in connection with Beethoven, and contrasted them with the composers of the early gen earlier generations. And Hoffman's point is that Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven are the first truly romantic composers in history, because 
they wrote purely instrumental music. They wrote music that wasn't vocal, that wasn't tied down to the spoken word or to any particular text or any particular dramatic action. Uh, the genres where Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven excelled was in purely instrumental music, symphonies, string quartets, piano sonatas. And Hoff, Hoffman's point was that purely instrumental music is the most romantic form of art of all because its sole subject is the infinite that it puts us in touch with things that we can't define, that we can't explain, that we can't conceptualize. So that's really where the, the sublime first becomes a, a serious criterion of musical aesthetics in that very famous review, uh, Hoffman's famous review of that Beethoven concert. So, and that's an idea that comes up again and again throughout the 19th century. Uh, in Va you mentioned Wagner, that's, a, that's also an excellent example. So yeah, you have that. It's the same also in, in, in painting. That, that is fascinating. You, you have the same exact, in the same time period, the same art movement with the same exact, only completely different people. Perhaps some of them have never, have never seen paintings. They're not into paintings, they're composers. And they, they have the exact same, same ideas. So that is really, I think, a great example of how the philosophy, the, the metaphysical ideas, the epistemological, ethical ideas of the time really affected the aesthetical ideas. You have the, it's the ideas of Hegel, it's the ideas of Kant that, that brought all these, these uh, themes into music and uh, painting and sculpture. And literature. Now, actually, to the best of my knowledge, the idea of the sublime originated in poetry. The, the, the first person that I know of to mention that context is that, that concept is Friedrich Schiller. Mm -hmm. There was a famous essay by Schiller in the 1790s called On Naive and Sentimental Poetry. And in that one, he contrasts the poetry of the ancient Greeks, like Homer, Hesiod, uh, and the Athenian tragedians with the works of contemporary poets. And he says the ancient Greeks were naive. They were able to express emotions in a very natural, very unsophisticated, but very powerful sort of way. And then he says our contemporary poets, I, presumably he included himself in that, are sentimental in that they, they, they deliberately strive to embody, to express certain emotions. And then he saw the sublime as being something that would come in the future as a kind of a synthesis, you know, a kind of Hegelian synthesis of the naive and the sentimental. That's that's fascinating. It really is. I, I've I've always been thinking about the idea of the sublime, and it, it's a mistake people do make again and again. They they think it's about individualism. It's about how great man is, how he's able to achieve. But it it and I would also argue that if you can get that sort of emotional response from, from these works of art, then it's great. It's, it, and that's the beauty thing, beautiful thing about art, about great art, is that you can get a lot of different emotions from it. And even yeah, and I think a central idea of the sublime is that the individual is supposed to be somehow overwhelmed by the experience. You know the saying, life is short, art is long. I think that plays an important role in the sublime as well. So. Over the course of the 19th century, you see certain trends. Orchestras keep getting larger and larger, you know, until we get to the Wagnerian orchestra, which has you know, more than 100 instruments. Uh, operas and symphonies get longer and longer so that eventually you get to the symphonies of Anton Bruckner, the symphonies of Gustav Mahler, you know, these very, very long symphonies where the music just takes you on this incredible journey. And of course, in literature, you see that as well. You see these very long novels of Victor Hugo, like Les Miserables, uh, novels like Tolstoy's War and Peace, where you just get so buried, so immersed in the experience that it just takes you far away from your your, your ordinary life uh, and takes you to a completely different time, different Also places. in Atlas Shrugged. Yeah, yeah. And there's still examples even in the early 20th century that sublime art takes you out of yourself and just takes you to this completely different world of experiences. And that's something that I always wanted to, to, to portray when I was, I wanted to, to, I still do want to become an artist. I've, I've been to, to art school in my high school. I, I did art class, but I, I wasn't that great in painting, but I always wanted to, I always wanted to do the, the big, the big landscape pictures, the big, uh, well, where you see one work and it's all encompassing. It, it talks about everything. It's, a, it's also, it's about politics, it's about ethics, it's about metaphysics, it's about everything. That, that's all, all, also Atlas Shrugged. That's why 
I myself am, uh, I, I liked Atlas the most. It is affected me the most out of all uh, of the no Ayn Rand's novels. And it's Absolutely. also- and In that connection, I would mention a famous quote from Gustav Mahler, who uh, he was talking about the nature of the symphony. And he said, a symphony must be like a world. It must embrace everything. And that certainly is true of Mahler's symphonies, and it's true of the symphonies of Bruckner and a few other composers. I, I tried to listen to Mahler's first, I think, and it's okay. it's one hour long. I, I could never could never finish it, right? It's it's a, it's a very it's a task to to go and listen to one of Mahler's. Uh, it is. I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily begin with Mahler's first symphony if you're completely unfamiliar with his music. I would actually begin with some of his songs. Try listening to some of his song cycles, like Songs of a Wayfarer or the songs from the Youth's Magic Horn. There's Knaben Wunderhorn in German. Uh, those are a little bit a little bit more concise. And actually, the interesting thing is that the symphonies sometimes build on some of the themes introduced in the songs or in the song cycles. Okay. So I, I, I can give I, lots I, of specific recommendations for how to get into Gustav Mahler. But yeah, the symphonies are very, very big and you have to approach them in the right way. Yeah, that's, I, I guess that's uh, why people like uh, Beethoven the most. The symphonies are very, I would say, uh, they're not simple, but they're easy to, 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 to go along with. They're easy to start listening and to, to go all the way because they're always, there's always action there. There's always something uh, that you can, it, it won't bore you because uh, we have a one hour long piece of music. It can get boring at, at, at a lot of points. But remember, Be Beethoven's symphonies were not easy for his contemporaries. When the Eroica Symphony was first performed, people thought it was monstrously long and unbearable. They, they just couldn't get through it. Yeah. <laughs> because in Beethoven's first two symphonies, uh, Symphony Number no. 1 in C major, Symphony Number no. 2 in D major, were written within the basic dimensions and style of Haydn and Mozart, you know, the, 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 the London symphonies of Haydn, the late symphonies of Mozart. Beethoven's third symphony, the Eroica, it really broke the mold. It was bigger, it was longer. I mean, a complete performance of that symphony runs to about 45 to 50 minutes. So we're, we're almost getting to the kind of a time scale of a Gustav Mahler there. And it wasn't just the, the length, like the sheer clock time of the symphony, but just the, the breadth and scope of its ideas that it, it took quite a few years for audiences to catch up to Beethoven and to catch up with his thinking. And that was true with each of his subsequent, subsequent symphonies that they, they challenged listeners not just in terms of length and in terms of ideas, but in terms of the forcefulness with which Beethoven communicated his ideas. So in that sense, Beethoven was as ahead of his time as Wagner or Mahler or some later composers. I don't know if you remember, there was a very, very powerful uh, passage in uh, the Fountainhead in the, the start of the fourth part, if you remember, where there was- The, the boy on the bicycle? The boy on the bicycle, yes. Yeah. And she makes a beautiful connection between, between beauty and art and uh, its effect, its profound effect, I would say, about, about your psychology, about how you, how you approach the, the, in every aspect of life and how it can change you, how it can make you be, how it can, uh, I would say, it can train you even to, to, to deal with life once you are, encompassing yourself with with beautiful art with beautiful not only art uh, all the things that are beautiful beautiful uh, uh, decoration beautiful furniture in your house it can really really change everything about you and she mentions there that in that passage she mentions the Rachmaninoff second concerto and uh, Tchaikovsky first first right and and it's it, I was thinking about our conversation when I was I was reading it uh, yesterday because I was searching for quotes and I, I I stumbled across this beautiful passage and I would like to I would write a post about it in the future. So, yeah. Now you asked me a little bit earlier about beauty and music, and I made the point of melody, Italian melody. Another I think important source of beauty is the, the use of the orchestra, the handling of the instruments of the orchestra. Now, I said that Russian composers learned about melody by studying the Italians. I would say that Russian composers learned how to write for the orchestra by studying French composers. And now the first great Russian composer, the father of Russian music was Mikhail Glinka, 
uh, who is very well known. I mean, he's revered in Russia. He's not so well known outside of Russia, uh, but a very, very great composer. Uh, he was actually friends with Hector Berlioz, you know, the great French composer who wrote the Symphonie Fantastique, Herald in Italy. Uh, he very closely studied Berlioz's works, how Berlioz used the orchestra, the very novel effects that he was able to create. And if you look at other Russian composers, take Tchaikovsky, for example. Tchaikovsky loved Italian opera for its melody, but he also loved French ballet. He loved the ballet music of Adolphe Adam, you know, like Giselle, that famous ballet, Léo Delib. Uh, he loved the music of Georges Bizet, Charles Gounod. And there's something about the polish, about the smoothness of French orchestration that I think appealed very much to Russian composers. Now, I think one of the very greatest orchestrators of all time was Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, uh, one of my all-time favorite composers. Uh, there's just a kind of a, an irresistible sensuous beauty to Rimsky-Korsakov's orchestration, that it's, it's almost a, an end in itself. And uh, I, I have to make a distinction here between the sort of the classical aesthetic of how to handle the orchestra and the romantic aesthetic of how to handle the orchestra. The distinction here is between what I would call structural orchestration and coloristic orchestration. By structural orchestration, which is what we see in Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, and earlier composers, the use of the orchestra is meant to emphasize the form of the music, the, the, the structure of the music. Whereas with coloristic orchestration, which we see in Carl Maria von Weber, Hector Berlioz, and then later composers like Rimsky-Korsakov, it's just the sheer beauty, the sheer allure of how the orchestra is handled, the, the multifarious colors that the composer is able to get out of the music. That becomes not just a means to an end, but an end in itself. It becomes an actual object of admiration. And uh, I, in, the, in, the, in the case of Rimsky-Korsakov, I can only mention the profound influence that he had on all the composers who came after him. Claude Debussy, Maurice Ravel, Igor Stravinsky, uh, Sergei Prokofiev, of course, Stravinsky actually studied with Rimsky-Korsakov. So, but or, I mean, orchestration is another huge uh, subject that one can talk about. In I think you should, you should uh, after this video, we need to send people to listen to some pieces. Maybe you should make me a list and I'll put it in the description. If anyone is wanted in, in, uh, in light of the, the episode, uh, if we if we manage to motivate any of you listeners to go and listen to some great music, I think uh, Nicholas, you could provide our listeners with a with a start at least. So a playlist, yes, I will do that. That's an excellent idea. That's great. Art has to be perceptual. It has to be understandable by just a glance of it. You you look at the statue of David. You you understand it. You understand what it's about. You understand. Every aspect of it, you will understand much more by studying it, by 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 learning about its history, by listening to perhaps what the artist has said about it. But the great art, by the mean glance of it, by listening to it, just listening to it, just looking at it, just you will get the whole picture. That's that's the beauty of of beautiful great art that it it can achieve. So what do you say about that? Well, we don't really have a fully worked out aesthetic theory of music, a fully worked out theory of how to how to aesthetically judge musical works of art. Uh, that's uh, that's that's an area of, of for, for future research. So uh, I can only offer a few ideas. Uh, one, one suggestion, actually, which I've been currently working on in the courses that I've been teaching over the past year is to try to find parallels or points of contact between music and other arts, particularly music and literature. So over the past year, I've taught courses on Shakespeare and music, Goethe's Faust and music, Friedrich Schiller's plays and opera as a way of just of, of trying to approach the subject. Uh, for example, taking a, taking a literary subject, a, whether a, a play by Shakespeare or a play by Schiller, and examining how a composer takes the idea, the characters, the themes, the, the essence of the plot, and tries to communicate it in music, and then asking certain questions. In what way does the composer approach this subject successfully? How well does the composer communicate the literary idea, the characterization, the plot through music? What perhaps could the composer do a little bit more successfully? So if we take some kind of an intersection between music and another art form, that gives us a step towards evaluating music aesthetically. But in terms of just taking a pure piece of music, like say a Beethoven symphony or a Beethoven piano sonata, 
as, as yet, we don't really have the language for analyzing that aesthetically. So I'm, I'm trying to use other art forms as a, as a route towards coming up with some sort of an aesthetic theory of musical evaluation. Uh, at some point, I'd like to actually try that. Maybe this is something you and I could collaborate on in the future of uh, use, doing the same principle, but with painting, with the visual arts, because there have been cases of composers influenced by paintings or famous artworks. Well, do you know the famous piece by Rachmaninoff called The Isle of the Dead? No, no. Based on the painting by Bucklin, he was a, um, I forget where he was from, but uh, look it up. Look up Rachmaninoff, The Isle of the Dead. It was inspired by a famous painting. Uh, there are a few other examples of well, as well of composers inspired uh, either by works of art or by landscapes or by seascapes. Oh, well, here's a familiar example, Mussorgsky, mm -hmm. Pictures at an Exhibition. Do you know Mussorgsky's Pictures at an Exhibition? I think so. I think Original, it, well, if you like art and if you like music, that's definitely a piece that I would explore. It was originally written for piano, Mussorgsky wrote it for piano, and but it's better known in the orchestration made by Maurice Ravel. The orchestral version by Ravel is, is really, really famous. Uh, so the story behind it is Mussorgsky had a friend named Victor Hartmann, who was an artist. He did sketches, watercolors, and Hartmann died at a tragically young age. And there was a, a retrospective exhibition of Hartmann's works, which Mussorgsky attended. Uh, and Afterwards, Mussorgsky wrote this famous piece, Pictures at an Exhibition, it, oh. inspired by the various sketches and watercolors and drawings and designs that he had seen at this. And I, I could probably think of a few other I can examples. see also that connection with, uh, with, with literature, as you said. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Crime and Punishment. Uh, when I was reading Crime and Punishment, I could always hear the beginning of uh, Tchaikovsky's uh, 18, 1812 overture. Yeah. It really sounded like uh, Raskolnikov's wandering the street of uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, I can always uh, feel that because you get that atmosphere. It, it, it really goes well with it. And I, I would say that's why music is, is now uh, integrated so well with uh, film because it, it, it just goes so beautifully together. It, it enhances the, the effect that the film has uh, very much. So... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, art, I argued uh, a few years ago that the best form of art is, is, is film because it, it, com it combines all the great uh, arts together into one uh, magnificent creation, all encompassing complete uh, uh, experience. But I, I do not hold that uh, position anymore, but I think it, it does, when it's more integrated, when it's there's it's more there are more levels of uh, of art. It's not only music; it's also visual. It's also it, you understand. So it builds up into getting to the whole complete uh, experience that it is. But uh, I, I, it's a difficult subject. We still need to to think about it a bit more. Yeah, it, sounds like, it sounds like what you're describing in connection with similar, it's, it's like Wagner's idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk, the total work of art. So you know how Wagner, he, he wrote the text, the poetic text for all of his own operas, as well as the music. And he was also in charge of very often rehearsing the orchestra, training the singers. He, was, he, he had a lot of control over the staging, the set design, uh, the details of the acting, the gestures of the singers. Uh, he had this single all-embracing conception of what he wanted to prevent, present on stage, not just in terms of the music, but in terms of the scenery, the staging, uh, the, the poetic experience, everything. I mean, in, in a way, Wagner is kind of the ancestor of the, the great film directors of the 20th century, That's like Cecil B. DeMille, for example, Charlie Chaplin, uh, who had, or, or Orson Welles, who had total, con who, whose goal was to have total control over every aspect of the work of art, uh, of the finished product. Wow, I, I, ne I never knew that about it, about it but I always uh, had that, uh, I always liked uh, Wagner, even though he's controversial in Israel. Uh, is, is Wagner's music still unofficially taboo in the state of Israel? It is, it is. People will look at you very, <laughs> they, they will judge you quite harshly if you're listening to Wagner. And Well, I do, I, I can understand that, uh, that, that psychological, uh, uh, you know, that an antagonistic uh, approach to Wagner, but he, he was a great uh, artist. 
and I don't think you should uh, you should hold um, an artist. Uh, it, it, it's it's irrelevant. What, whatever ideas he had on politics, he are completely irrelevant to his to his um, music. So would you say then that you agree with uh, Daniel Berenboim, who some years ago, there was this big controversy where he he performed a little bit of Wagner with the Israel Philharmonic, but it was actually after a concert. It was as an encore. He presented the prelude to Tristan and Isolde, which is, I think, one of Wagner's most beautiful and most accessible pieces. And apparently people were up in arms about this. People were protesting. Yeah. They were, you know, now, nowadays we talk about cancel culture. They were trying to cancel Daniel Berenboim. And uh, it was a really huge controversy. So would you say you're... You were you're sympathetic of his attempts to bring Wagner uh, into into Israel. Yes, I'm all for bringing beautiful, great music to everywhere. I want everything to be filled with beautiful things, beautiful music, beautiful paintings, beautiful clothing. Everything should be beautiful. That's what I'm always saying. And you know, here's a strange story. Now there was a time. Uh, I, I assume this was in the past. There was a time when the music of Richard Strauss was banned in Israel as well. Now, that, now it's true that Richard Strauss stayed in Germany during the war years, and he he kind of unofficially collaborated with the Nazis. Uh, he had he held an official post uh, within, the, but but he wasn't a member of the Nazi Party. He was not an anti-Semite himself. In fact, uh, he ran afoul of Goebbels because Strauss insisted on collaborating with a Jewish librettist uh, named Stefan Zweig, who was one of Strauss's favorite librettists. Uh, they collaborated on a number of operatic projects. And uh, I actually know that Goebbels disliked Strauss and, and for, for, for a number of reasons. And Strauss had very negative views of Hitler and the Nazis. In spite of that, the fact that he stayed, that he didn't leave the country, but he kind of remained and collaborated uh, has always been something of a mark against him. But uh, he himself was not an anti-Semite. He had a daughter-in-law who was Jewish. You know, his son's wife was Jewish. Oh, really? uh, and he had a number of, yeah, yeah. He had a number of close friends and colleagues who were Jewish and whom he tried to help because of his position you know, his, that he collaborated. He tried to help other musicians who were in unfortunate positions with, with respect to the, uh, the, uh, the official doctrine during that time. Yeah, I, it's, well, it's a, it's a difficult issue to touch on, but I, I would say regarding his music, uh, you have that uh, very, it's also re related to film. You have uh, the tw the beginning of uh, 2001, the Space Odyssey, or in Od an Odyssey in Space. Uh, the famous beginning uh, performed by Richard Str Strauss, right? Oh, the also, also Sprach Zarathustra. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so I think uh, I think we should we should wrap it up, uh, Nikos. Uh, it has been very very interesting. Uh, I'm very glad that we did it. Um, hopefully, we'll do it again soon. And uh, and thank you very much uh, for being a part of uh, of aesthetics decentralized. Thank you for having me on it, and I look forward to putting together a playlist that you can oh, share yes. with your viewers of this video. Look forward to that in the description. Uh, I hope that we will have it there. And uh, I'll see you all in the next episode. So thank you all. Thank you.